Amen. You can be seated. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We're in the middle of this series called The Miracles of Jesus. And our, our goal in the midst of this is to really recognize God's authority over everything in our lives. To really get a glimpse of how big He is, uh, but also how much He cares about us individually, how much He cares and He wants to interact with our lives. And hopefully in the midst of all of those revelations, it changes the way that we pray. We start to pray a little bit bigger. We start to pray in greater anticipation of Him moving. So over the past several weeks, we looked at Jesus' dominion over demons and how He commands and they have to flee. They, they, they can't stand up to Him. He's more powerful than they are. And then we looked at Jesus' dominion over diseases, that if Jesus chooses, if it's His will and He speaks the word that it doesn't matter if doctors know what's going on. It doesn't matter if you know what's going on. If Jesus chooses in that moment to speak the word, then there's healing that's there. If, if he chooses to give his touch, there's healing that's there. And so there's no barriers with him if he chooses to do that. And sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. But he always has our best interests in mind. Even when we don't understand, he sees this bigger picture. And so now we're kind of wrapping up our series. We're going to look at the next three or four weeks over Jesus' dominion over everything else. We talked about his dominion over demons, his dominion over diseases. And so now we're going to look at his dominion over every other thing. And so we're going to look at some specifics. This, this week we're looking at his dominion over all creation. And then next week we're going to look at his dominion over provision, like uh, all of our finances and things that we need for that. And then we've got uh, his dominion over death and his dominion even over religious rules. And so uh, we're going to study about those things as we continue this Miracles of Jesus. So if you got your Bibles, let's look together. Mark chapter 4 verse 35 and I, all of those songs tie in so perfectly to what we're talking about today because you can be smack dab in the center of God's will and it require you to go through a storm right now, now here's the thing most of us we know the reality it's not a question of if you'll go through storms in your life it's a question of when, right? Uh, you live in this world. This world is a fallen world. And so you're going to have troubles. Jesus said, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked when this fiery trials come on you as if something strange were happening to you. Uh, we're all going to go through tough things in life. Somebody's going to get sick. Somebody's going to get cancer. We're going to have loved ones that pass away. We're going to have people in our lives that go through times of depression or struggle emotionally or mentally or physically. There's storms in this life. It's not a question of if it's a question of when but see for believers it's something even more than that and it's a question of when we go through the storms of life are you going to get out of it what the Lord has sent you into the storm to obtain because the truth of the matter is the Lord himself is the one who leads us into these times of testing and trial and it's so that our faith can be developed and grown so that we walk out the other side having seen the glory and the wonder of God because he stood up and he spoke to our storm and said peace be still and we've witnessed a miraculous handling of God. Or he's allowed this storm to continue to rage around us and he's spoken to us. As his children, he says, peace, be still to our hearts. E either way, we have this opportunity for peace in the midst of the storm. That if we weren't going through the storm, we would have never seen God's hand move in such a powerful way. Either to stop the storm or to stop our hearts from having these fears and anxieties. And so either way, we can have peace. We're going to look at what Jesus is trying to teach us through these stories of his dominion over all of creation and over these storms. So if you got your Bibles, let's look together. Mark chapter 4, we're going to start with verse 35. And then we're going to flip over to Matthew chapter 14. So you may just want to put a little bookmark in Matthew chapter 14. But let me give you the context of what's happening here. Jesus has just finished teaching a full days long of parables. And so, you know, the parables of the stories Jesus would use as illustrations for the people. And so he's just wrapped up talking about faith. And you remember the story he told about the farmer, right? He says a farmer goes out and he casts seed. And so some long, lands along the path. And what happens? The birds come. And they snatch the seed before it can get planted. And he takes it away. And then there's some seed that's sown on rocky ground. And so it springs up really quickly. And so it, it shoots out. But then the, the sun comes out and it wilts. The plan because it really had no foundation. But there's other seed that's sown among the thorns and among the weeds. And what happens through that? It grows up pretty quickly. But the weeds and the thorns kind of choke out the life out of this 
plant, but then some of it lands on good soil. And, and, and that comes, and then there's a harvest of 30, 50, 100 times what has been planted. And so Jesus is talking about faith and how when we spread the seed of the gospel, there's all these different reactions to it. Sometimes it's snatched away from people. Sometimes people respond right away, but they don't really know what they're responding to. And so they have no foundation. And so their faith wilts when the hard times of life come. Other times people, they spring up, but they let the cares and the concerns and the troubles of the circumstances of this life become predominant and it chokes out their faith so that it has no power and then there's the good seed where you have this faith and it just continues to grow and grow and grow well Jesus just wraps up this parable and now he's going to give an opportunity for the disciples to really put their faith to the test and put to the test what they've been really learning now do you find that this happens with you like, uh, if you don't, it's probably happening and you're frustrated and you don't realize it. But, but whenever you're reading God's Word, he, He's going to give you opportunities to put into action what you've been learning. And so as you study stuff in church or you study stuff on your own or you're listening on the radio and you're reading all these things and you're studying about what the Lord would have you do, chances are that week, that moment, that next day, you're going to get an opportunity to put into practice what you supposedly learned, Right? And that's what happens with these disciples. So he's just talked about faith. And now he's going to give them an opportunity to show what kind of faith they really have. And so look at what it says. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And they're going across to the other side of the, the sea or the lake there. And here's what it says. And leaving the crowd, they took him with him in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with him. Here, here's what happened. Jesus arrives on the shore that day. And so large a crowd shows up. that he, There's literally nowhere for him to stand. The crowd is pushing him further and further back towards the shore and towards the sea. So he gets into a boat and he pushes off a little bit from land. And the whole crowd is sort of seated on the countryside there in this sort of natural amphitheater. And Jesus teaches all day long about parables. And then he says, I'm done. And so the disciples say, well, sit down then. And so he sits down in the boat and then he says, let's go to the other side. And they say, okay. And so they just took him right as he was and they start to row to the other side. Now, now here's what happens. Listen to this. Verse 37. And a great windstorm arose and the waves were what? Breaking, Breaking into the boat. So that the boat was already filling. Another gospel says that the boat was already swamped. Right? You ever been in a swamped out boat? Like, you, Have you ever had to do bucket brigade duty on, on a boat that's singing? That's a scary moment, isn't it? And he said, another gospel says they were in real danger. And so this, this great windstorm, the, the, the term that's used for it, it's actually in terms with seismic activity. And so this was a region, there could have been some earthquakes. There's, it's along the Jordan Rift that goes along underneath. And so there may have been some sort of seismic thing that occurred. We don't know what kind of storm it was, but this was a mega storm. Storms were really common in that area. It was sort of built, there are these mountains that are all around, and then there's this bowl that the lake is down in. And so storms would come over the mountains and rush down onto the lake. And so storms were pretty common in this area. But think of who's in the boat you got guys that have been professional fishermen their entire lives, right? You know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they, Jesus comes to them and says, drop your nets, boys. Like, come follow me. I'll make you fishers a minute. So these guys, they're on the boat. And, and they're terrified. And these are professional fishermen. Like, I want you to think of Bering Sea, like crab fishermen. Like, they don't get scared at any storms. You know, it's like just running the mill. And these guys are terrified and the boat is totally filling up and they really are in danger it's not like a perception of danger you know I feel like we're in danger it's like no you're not in danger you are you, you don't just feel that way you look and there's water coming up in the boat and there's the waves that are just pitching you back and forth and they're trying to steer and row the boat the best they can to crest over the top of the wave and then land down and look at in the middle of all this what's Jesus doing? Look what it says, verse 38. But he was in the stern, what? Asleep on the cushion. Now, do you, do you have anybody in your life that can sleep through anything? Do you have anybody like that, right? That, that was Jesus. He's there. I mean, he's had a long day. He's been teaching in the hot sun. And, uh, and so he's tired. But, but I think even more than that, even more than his... 
tiredness. I think he's trying to model for the disciples. Here's what you can do in the midst of the storm. You can be at complete peace even though the storm is raging all around. You don't have to get your knickers in a wad and, 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 and jump up and down and flip out. Like You can be at peace in the midst of the storm too. Jesus is there sleeping. Now this is a a diagram of a boat that they found back in the 80s. There was an archaeological dig, and this is a, a replica of that boat, but it was around that same area where Jesus and his disciples were. And so they dug this boat. This is what one of Jesus' boats probably looked like. And so the disciples are all there. They couldn't have the sail out because the windstorm was raging, and so they're just rowing along, and, and Jesus is up under that front part. They would throw a cushion underneath the stern, and so he's just laying up underneath there. And so the water is splashing in, and it's coming up, and then decide these professional fishermen are flipping out, and Jesus is resting peacefully. Now, now, now I love this verse. Some of you need to write this down. It's from Psalm 4, verse 8. But here's what it says In peace, I'll both lie down and sleep. For you alone, our Lord, make me dwell in safety. You heard that old phrase, clean conscience, you get a good sleep, right? You know, it's like, you're going to hit the pillow and you're out. It must be my clean conscience. Like, you got nothing else in your mind to think about. But, but literally, Jesus is there and he just has complete trust in his Father. He knows the Father has given him a mission to do. It's not complete yet. And so it doesn't matter what storms are raging. That doesn't determine what the final reality was going to be. This chapter's crazy, but, but the next chapter is going to be okay. And so he's there and he's just completely at rest, completely at trust. And his heavenly father, his heavenly father has his best interest at heart. And so he's at peace. Even though the storm is raging. Now look at what happens for them, the rest of verse 38. And they woke him saying to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Like another gospel says, save us now, right? Like if you were to do like an accurate total translation of what they're really saying, here's what, here's what they're saying. Teacher, are we to drown for all you care? In their moment, this word that they use for care, it's where we get our word melee. It's like, isn't something uh, a little upset inside of you? Like, don't you see what's going on? Like, we're drowning here. Like, the professional fishermen are scared. The tax collector is freaking out in the corner over there. Like, Jesus, what is going on in this moment? Like, doesn't this warrant a little bit of your concern? Doesn't this warrant a little bit of your attention? Doesn't this warrant, like, you're stepping in and interceding on our behalf? Because we're drowning here, Jesus. Like, don't you see it? Don't you care? care? Don't you love us? Have you ever felt like that? It, you know, it's okay to admit that, right? Like God's a big enough God, He can take that. In the middle of that moment, they just, they're new and their faith and they're just shaking Jesus. We need to make you aware of this situation going on in our lives, Jesus. You just seem like you're all slumbering somewhere. We need to fill you in on what's going on because we're drowning here, Jesus. And I love what he does. He, do, he doesn't take this moment to be like, well, you know, boys, grab a seat on the boat here while the storm's still raging. I'm teach you some theology about my care for you, right? Is that what he does? No, that's not what he does. Look at what he does. And he awoke and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, Peace! Be still! And the wind ceased. And there was a great what? Calm. I love this. Jesus doesn't use their... I mean, they're totally wrong. Jesus totally was concerned about them. He totally loved... He was just at rest, knowing that the Father had everything under control. But they look at that and they're like, you're not moving. You're not acting. Jesus, wake up. We're drowning here. What's wrong with you? And He doesn't step up to them and immediately say, what's wrong with you boys? He, he looks at the... Wind and he rebukes it. He speaks a word of rebuke over the wind. And then he looks at the sea and he says, Peace! Settle down! Be still! And then instantly, there's this great calm. Now, now how many of you have ever been out on the boat, on the lake, when there's a storm? Or out on the ocean when there's a storm, right? Okay, now, when the storm ceases, is, is the water automatically calm right away? No. Never, Right? Now, now, some people, they would look at this and be like, Jesus spoke to the wind and then it stopped. Whoa, man, that was incredible timing. 
Like uh, the storm was just scheduled to end and Jesus spoke and it stopped. But, but even the waves instantly were gone. Now I want you to imagine the disciples. They're knee deep in water and they are literally flipping out. We're going to die. Like, does anybody have a life raft? We don't have life rafts. They haven't been invented yet. Does anybody have... A life preserver? No, but we'll use Peter's cloak. Like, I mean, they don't know in this moment. And they're flipping out and they're like, Don't you see? Can't you see what we're going through? Doesn't this concern you at all? Wake up, Jesus! And Jesus, instead of giving them a lesson, He, he gives calm to the storm. Like just in His act of grace. Instead of saying, you boys don't get it. You can be at peace. Like I'm at peace. You can just lay down right here too. You're going to be fine. Like in the middle of that. He just, He answers with peace. And He calms the storm. I love that. That's an act of grace. Now, now this is an artist's rendering of what's going on in this scene. I don't know if you can see it from there, but it's a really cool painting. There's these images of uh, like angelic and demonic uh, forces going at it above in the spiritual realm. And there's the little boat that's about to be overtaken. And then as soon as Jesus rebukes the wind and says, peace be still, look, look, this is a picture of what it might have looked like in that moment. Now can you imagine witnessing that? I mean, you are knee deep up to your eyeballs in fear and doubt and you're wondering about the care of God and you just, you're shaking heaven's door saying, don't you see? Can't you help us? Come on, you've got to do something. And Jesus in His great grace, instead of correcting them in this moment as they're young in their faith, He just steps up and He speaks to the storm. Instead of speaking, He just speaks to peace, be still. And immediately it's gone. This act of grace. Now look at what he says to them afterwards. Now it's time to teach. Verse 40, he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Why, why are you so cowardly? Why are you so timid? Why are you so fearful? Have you, have you still no faith? Now, now what did he just talk about? What parable? Parable about what? Faith. Right? Faith. He talked about faith. And he looks at them and he says, Hey, does this trigger a memory for you guys? Like, do you remember the seed that was sown among the thorns and the cares of this life choked it up? Do you remember the seed that was sown on the rock and it sprung up quickly, but then the, the craziness of life came in and it didn't have any root of faith and so it burned up? Like, he says, You've been with me so long. You still don't, you still don't trust me? You still don't trust that I'm in charge of everything? You still don't trust? Listen, look right here. They trusted in the power of the storm more than they trusted in the person of Jesus. Like in the middle of your life, do you ever do that? Like you trust in the power of your marriage? Man, my marriage is terrible. It's never going to get better. Like she's never going to change. He's never going to change. Like oh, 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 it's always going to be the same. It's hopeless as this and... Like, do you realize what you're, you're, you're saying that your marriage is more powerful than the person of Jesus, right? That, that's the same thing that they were doing in that moment. He says, don't you trust me? Don't you know who I am? It, it, listen, you do that in your finances. You look at all of this stuff and you trust in the power of your money or your ability to earn instead of trusting in the power of the person of Jesus to provide, Right? You trust in your own sickness's power instead of the power of Jesus. He says, you've got more confidence in the storm that it's going to do what it can do than instead of me and what I can do. Do you still not trust me? Now look at what they said. See, their actual problem wasn't the storm. Do you realize that? It was their misplaced fear. Like they elevated this other thing above their respect for Jesus. They're like, this is bigger! This is greater. This is higher. We're, we're never going to be able to overcome this. Like we're drowning. We're going to die. Instead of elevating Jesus above everything else. You're over everything. Why would we fear? We can trust you. No, no, no. Look at what he says. Verse 41. And they were filled with what? Great fear. Not, not of the storm anymore. They have this unbelievable respect and awe of Jesus. Look what it says. And they said to one another, Who, who is this? <laughs> Even the wind and the waves obey this guy. 
They still don't have complete faith. Like they aren't saying, hey, this is the Son of God. Look at this. He's over everything. He's over all of creation. He must be Lord over everything. They're still, who's this? I mean, even the wind and the waves obey this guy. That's amazing. But their fear of Jesus, their awe of Jesus and his power now trumps the fear of any created thing. Right? Now, now let's look and see. We're going to fast forward a little bit and they're going to go through another storm in their life. You, you kind of hope you grow in between storms, right? <laughs> like you kind of hope that the things that scared you before don't necessarily scare you now. You hope you make some progress in your faith and your relationship with God. Like that's how it's supposed to go. You're supposed to get a little bit, a little bit tougher, a little bit more mature, a little bit more ready in your walk with God. So let's fast forward a little bit. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to see how they handle a second storm. Let's look at what it says. Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to start with verse 22. This is right after Jesus has just heard that his best friend, his cousin, the forerunner, John the Baptist, has been killed. And so Jesus is grieving. Do you, you remember the moment that you found out that your loved one passed away? Like you remember that moment? And the feelings of grief? That you have, that, that's how Jesus was feeling in this moment. At the same time, his disciples come back from their first missions trip. And Jesus had just given them authority over demons and authority over diseases because he had it and he gave it to them. And so they've gone out and they've healed people and they've preached the gospel and, and, and they've cast away demons and they come back and they're so pumped in that moment. Now, have you ever been grieving and somebody wants to tell you something? Right? Like, oh, let's talk about me. Let's talk about, and this is that moment. This is what is going on with Jesus. And Jesus says, let's go away to a desolate place together. Let's get away from everything. Let's just be alone. Let's talk about your trip. Let's let me grieve. And, and so they get there on the other side of the sea and what happens? This huge crowd follows them. Have you ever wanted to be alone more than anything? Just to pray and be by your side and this like this people need you. People want you. Like that's what was going on with Jesus. And so so he teaches them. Five thousand men show up, and who knows how many women and children? It's probably twenty thousand people there. And so Jesus is preaching and teaching, and then it gets late, and the disciples are like, "I thought this was going to be a us time, Jesus." A lot of people around, like twenty thousand people. It makes kind of a hard time to just talk, just you, and and let's send them away. And he's like, "No, no, no. There's nowhere for them to eat. Like they're out in the middle of nowhere. Remember, we came to a desolate place, and you feed them, and they're like, we don't have anything to feed them.' And then there's the miracle of the five. Loaves and two fish feeds the 5,000 men, right? And so it's right after this. I want you to put yourself in the position of Jesus. Put yourself in the position of the disciples. They're tired. They're weary. They've been on this trip. They had this goal to get away and, and, and to rest. And then in the middle of that moment, the crowds need them. And they have to help. And they help all day long. And now it's nighttime. And Jesus puts them in a boat and sends them away. And they're going to row all night long. Tired and weary already. And they're getting ready to head into another storm. I want you to see what happens with them. Verse 22, immediately he made the disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain to pray by himself. Listen, if the Son of God needs time alone with the Father in prayer, how much more should we need that time alone with God? Here he is. It says, when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by that time was a long way from land. Beaten by the waves for the wind was against him. It's a similar kind of storm. This, this word for beaten, it's literally tormented, pain, agony, suffering. That sounds exactly how we describe being in the center of God's will, right? That's how we talk about it. Like, man, I'm in terrible pain. I must be doing something right. I mean, it, life is just agony right now. Like, I'm smack dab in the center of God's will. Is that, is that how we normally talk about Things no, like we even have little jokes about things, right? Like we'll say, "Oh, you got a good parking spot. You must be living right," you know, or, or, or like something good will happen in your life, and you'll make a joke about, it, like, "Oh, you must have had a good quiet time this morning," right? Like, but in the, they're smack dab in the center of God's will for their life, and, and Jesus sent them in the boat. It wasn't like they chose on their own. They go in the boat and they're like going their own way. But they're sailing smack dab into the center of another storm, and that's God's will for them. Because he wants to grow them. Even more, James tells us that uh, trials, they're there to develop our faith so that we can have perseverance, so that we can go through all of life and not lack any good thing. And so he knows that we're the closest to Jesus when we're the most dependent on him. And so in the midst of the storm, that's when you depend. And so Jesus sends them away and they're 
they're suffering again. But you know what? They're not as scared this time. Because they know who controls the storm. And so look at what happens. They're, they're tired. They're there. They're, they're rowing all night long. It says, and in the fourth watch of the night, that's like 4 a.m. So they've been rowing all night long. Now that doesn't sound like much of a vacation to me. <laughs> you know what? You guys need some rest. You know what you should do? You should get in a boat and you should row all night long. And you should battle the storm. Like that doesn't sound like my ideal getaway, right? But that was right exactly where God wanted them to be. But this time they're not as scared. Like the same circumstances are happening. They've been battling all night long. But, but there's not the same fear that's there. They've grown a little bit in their faith. Now, now look what happens. The fourth watch of the night, he came to them. What, what was he doing? Walking on the sea. How cool is that? Right? Like, I mean, that would have been amazing. Like, I would do anything to be able to just step up and be walking on the sea. And Jesus is like, wow, it's kind of wavy tonight, you know? Like, and he's walking on top of the waves and he's just going out. Now, the, another gospel tells us they're already three to four miles out. So Jesus just walking on top of the waves, three to four miles out, and he's getting ready to go by them. They have about one mile more left to row to the other side of the lake. And so Jesus' plan, another gospel tells us, is just to walk on by them. Like, I don't know if that changes the story for you at all. But like his goal, he was just going to walk on by and get to the other side and be like, what's up boys? Good to see you. How was your night? Now he wanted them to have this test of faith and to grow in their faith. And so he's there. But they spot him. And so the plans have to change. And look at what it says. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, what? I ain't afraid of no ghost. Now that's not what they said. They, they actually said, it's a ghost! It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. Now, now their understanding of ghosts is it was somebody's spirit, right? Or, or it was the, like um, in the Old Testament when you have Samuel's spirit called back from the dead. And this wicked sorceress calls because God allows his spirit to come back from the dead to send a message to the people. To King Saul. And so they, they, they think it's that. Like God has allowed somebody to come back and give us a message. Or, or, or they think uh, what we would look at today as, well that's an angel. Or that's a demon that's taking on some other form. And so they're there in this moment and they just flip out. Now, now uh, how many of you stayed up pulling an all-nighter? Three people. Fantastic. That's great. All right. So, so, but you know how you feel when it's like that 3 a.m. mark, man, your, your, eye, you, your eyes start playing tricks on you. You're like, you know, you, you kind of, you're falling down like your, your, your head bobs. You get the head bob thing going on and then you wake yourself up, you know, and you're like using your eyes like, oh, you know, and this is them. They're in the middle of this and they're taking shifts and, and Peter's like, James, come on, man. You never row. Like, get to rowing. Like, I'm taking a break. And, and so they're there and they're having these times and then often it's like they're, they're being pitched like this in the boat. The wind is rocking them and they come up to the crest of the wave and one of them looks off and sees something. Now it's like 4 a.m. And so the dawn is beginning to start to break. You see this, like the cover of moonlight. And so there's this thing, this figure walking out. And so they go down and they don't see it anymore. And they come up. And there it is again. And it's getting closer. And they're like, is that a fish? It's the biggest fish I've ever seen. It's not a fish. It's a ghost. And they're terrified. What's happening? And they're scared to death. And Jesus can't allow this to continue. He looks at him. He's like, well, I'm not just going to let him sit there in fear. I'm not going to let him sit there and think that there's this angel that is whatever. Or there's this demon that's whatever. Like, I'm not just going to let this happen. Now, now who, who's in charge of angels? Jesus. Who, who can command demons to go and do stuff or to be fleet or depart? Uh, Jesus, right? So even if it was an angel, they shouldn't have been afraid, right? Because we know who's in charge of everything. But they're scared to death. And so look at what Jesus does. Immediately Jesus spoke to them and said what? Read it with me. Take heart. It's I. Do not be afraid. I love this. Literally he's like man up. What's wrong with you boys? Take courage. Literally. Have courage. Be brave. He says there's no need to be scared. It's me. I'm the one who's here. Who else would be walking on the water? There's only one Son of God. It's me. I'm here. Don't be afraid. Now look at what happens next. 
Uh, does he stop the storm? <laughs> no. <laughs> I love that. Like, he, he stopped the storm before. This time they're, they're a little more mature. Like he, he doesn't stop it. Sometimes he stops the storm and he says peace to the storm. Other times, do you know what he does? He lets the storm rage on. But he speaks peace to you. Instead of speaking to the storm, he speaks to you. It's peace. He said, look at what he says. Peter answers him. Verse 28, Peter answered, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, now this translation is not great for the Lord if it's you. Like Peter knew it was the Lord. But what he was saying, what had they just done? They got back from a mission trip. And Jesus had authority over demons. And what did he do? He gave the disciples authority over demons. So they could go and cast out demons in Jesus' name. And Jesus had authority over diseases. And so what did he do? He gave the disciples authority over diseases. And so what did they go? They went and they touched people and healed people of their diseases. And so Peter's like, is this step 301? <laughs> this looks amazing. Like first power over demons and power over diseases. And now walking on the water. Like if you have all authority to do this, call me out onto the water. Like I want to do it too. So if you can do it and you let me cast out demons in your name and you let me cast out diseases in your name then, then let me do this in your name too like if you're out there that's where I want to be because we're not going anywhere anyway we've been rolling on that long and, and so call me out and so look at what it says verse 29 and he said come and so Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus now I wish that Mark would have recorded what the other conversation was in the boat. Right? Watch what's going to happen to Peter right here. He's going to totally sink. Like, he's totally going to go down. We're going to have to rescue him. Somebody get the boat ready. Right? Like, in this moment, like, I'm sure they weren't thinking he could walk on the water. I mean, they knew Jesus could, but they weren't thinking necessarily that Peter could. And so Peter hangs one leg over, and he's just like, if you can do it, and you're calling me, I'm locking eyes with you, and so I'm coming to you. And so he throws the other leg over, and he takes a step. And he's like, oh, this is amazing. And he's literally walking on top of the waves that are still going. Like, and I don't know if you ever had that. Do you ever have this story in a Sunday school lesson, right? You know, when you were young. or you, Like, there's always this picture of like this nice calm sea, you know. Peter's like walking out. The storm is still going on. The boat is still pitching like this. And Peter is just like walking up the wave. <laughs> this is amazing. This is cool. And he's walking on the water on top of the waves, victorious over the storm that's in his life. And he makes it all the way to Jesus. This is incredible. Now look at what it says. Verse 30. But when he what? Saw the wind. So where was he looking before when he was walking on the water? Who, who was he looking at? Jesus. Jesus. But now what is he looking at? The wind. He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Like he had this moment of victory. Like Jesus didn't speak to the storm. Like he didn't say... Peace, be still. And then all see the grace of God by, by Jesus calming the storm. Instead, Jesus speaks to him. He, he just speaks peace over Peter's heart. And even though the storm is still raging, he's walking over top of that sucker. He's like, it doesn't matter. Let the storm rage on. I'm walking in victory on top of the water. It doesn't matter what the storm is. Jesus doesn't have to speak peace to the storm. He just spoke peace to me. And so I'm living victorious, baby. Like, this water feels good on these toots. I've been in this boat all night long. And so he's going because he's locked eyes with Jesus. Look at me. The second he took his eyes off of Jesus and he looked at the circumstances. They were, had they changed? No, it was the same set of circumstances he had victory over just two seconds before. But, but he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he looks at how bad the storm is and how dire the wind and the waves are and instantly his great look at me his greatest victory turns into a rescue mission just like that like his greatest moment I'm walking in victory it doesn't matter what's going on in my marriage I'm walking in victory it doesn't matter what's going on with my body I trust Jesus he hasn't spoken peace to the storm he spoke peace to my heart and so I'm walking in victory but the instant 
that he took his eyes off of Jesus and he looked at his situation. He's drowning. He goes from victory to a rescue mission like that. Because he took his focus off of Jesus. Now in that moment, what do you think Jesus' reaction is to Peter? Do you think he looks at him like, I think I'm going to let him uh, suck down a little bit of water first. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, he's cried out to me. Like, he walked on the water. He took his eyes off of me. It's his fault. He took his eyes off of me. And so now he's drowning. And so he gets what he gets, right? Like, I'm going to let him until he throws up the one, two. I'm going down for the third time. Like, until he's on that time, I'm just letting him drown. Is that what Jesus does? No, look at what he says. Verse 31. Jesus, how soon? immediately reached out his hand and he took hold of him saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? I, lo I love this moment. And some people give Peter a hard time about this. Like, oh man, how could he doubt in that moment? Listen, every disciple was a doubter. He was the only one that had any faith at all. Like, I'd rather be the guy getting back in the boat wet than the guy that stood at the side of the boat with fingernails cracked. What's going to happen? I'm scared to death. Like, I'd rather be the guy that tried and, and looked towards Jesus and had great success and then I was drowning. Like, I'd rather be that guy any day of the week than the jokers that stayed in the boat. And Jesus looks at him and he pulls him back up to the surface and says, My son... Why'd you doubt me? Why'd you doubt? Why'd you let doubt creep in? If you just would have kept your eyes locked on me, you would have stayed victorious above the storm. Why, why did you start to look at all these other things? Why did you look at the power of the storm instead of me, the person of Jesus? Why'd you do that? Look at what happens next. Verse 32. When they got in the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the what? The Son of God. They knew who he was that time. That, that is, who is this? That even the water quakes beneath his feet, and he walks on top of it. Like They, they don't have that same response that they did the first. They know who Jesus is. Says, Surely, this is the Son of God. What can we learn from these two stories? Write these three things down really quickly. Number one. Number one. Since Jesus is in charge over all creation, you should never fear anything that He made more than you fear Him. Right? Like, this is just super practical. There's some of you that you've got fears that have been passed down to you for generations, right? Or you got fears or anxieties that have been passed down to you since you were a child, right? You know, and you're, you, you lived through whatever storm. Storm, you know, 72. It was the worst one ever. You went through the flood or what? And now, anytime there's something on the radar, man, you flip out. I want to tell you, you don't have to. You can respect storms, but you should respect Jesus' power even more than the power of the storm, right? You should trust that you're in the hand of the Father. Nothing can happen to you unless it's your time. He's sovereign. He's in control. He's the one who commands every lightning bolt where to go. and He can make your life as easy as He wants to. He can make it a tough season in your life if He wants to. But He loves you and He has all of your best interests at heart. Listen, you might write it down like this. Here's another way to say it. You should always trust the power and the person of Jesus over the power of your circumstances. Right? Like, listen, you might be able to think of it in this way. Like, when you look at your marriage, you have this choice. Am I trusting the power of my circumstance or am I trusting the person of Jesus? Like, oh, they'll never change. It's hopeless. Well, it's not hopeless if Jesus is there. The person of Jesus is greater than the person that you're married to. Listen, are you looking at your finances and you say, Oh, you know, what are we going to do? I, I'm flipping out. I'm a little scared. Like it feels like we're swamped in the boat, right? And in the middle of that moment, you have this choice. You can look at your circumstances around you and you can trust the power of those circumstances or you can trust the power and the person of Jesus. Say, God, you know what? You can calm this storm. You can give me a better job. You can send money unexpectedly or you can... Speak peace to my heart. Right? 
Some of you, you've got prodigal kids that, man, you're in the storm of your life. They're just wandering away from the Lord. And you're, why in the world are they doing this? God, why am I having to go through this? Like, I, I trained them up in the way they should go. And I, I'm claiming this promise. They're going to come back to it one day. But why am I sailing through this storm right now, God? And you can look at the power of your circumstances and say, oh, it's hopeless. Or you can look at the person of Jesus and say, he's over all of this. He's over all of it. Must entrust the person of Jesus. Number two, write this down. When you trust Jesus, it unlocks the door for God to speak peace to the storm or peace to you. Like you realize that? Like if you weren't going through the storm, you never have a chance to experience God saying, Peace, be still to the storm. You never have a chance to witness that. If you weren't going through the middle of a storm, you never have a chance for God to speak Peace, be still to your heart so that the storm is raging all around you. But you could say, you know what? It sounds like some time for sleepy time on the cushion right now. You know what? It sounds like time for me to walk on top of the water and live victoriously over these circumstances. Even though the storm is raging all around me, I'm at peace. Because God didn't say peace, be still to the storm. He said it to my heart. And so I'm good. I'm okay. Even though everything's not okay. I'm still okay. Number three, write this down. Last one. Listen, you'll go from your greatest spiritual victory to the valley of hopelessness the moment that you take your eyes off of Jesus to focus on your own situation. This is totally true. You, listen, you can be at your greatest spiritual high totally dependent on Jesus and who He is. You, you, you can be walking in victory and you're like, man, I've got victory over my pride. I've got victory over this sin of anger. I've got victory over this storm in my life. It doesn't matter what's going on in my marriage. I'm still going to love my partner with grace even when if it kills me. Like, you, you can be in the middle. That's a joke, people. Calm down. <laughs> man, like, in the middle of this moment, you can be like, it doesn't matter what storm rages on with my kids. I'm going to love them. I'm going to serve them sacrificially. I'm going to show them the unconditional love of Jesus. It doesn't matter what's going on with my finances. I'm going to walk in victory over that storm. He can calm the storm or He can calm my heart. And so I'm walking victorious. I'm sleeping on the cushion with Jesus. Like I'm good no matter what goes on. But the second you take your eyes off of Jesus and you put it on your circumstances, immediately you sink. You, you go from wave walking to a rescue mission. The second you take your focus off of Jesus and you put it on your situation, like instantly, it's hopeless. It'll never get better. Things are never going to change. I'm so scared. I'm so fearful. I'm so anxious. That's because you stopped looking at Jesus and you looked at the junk that was going on and you elevate its power over the person of Jesus. You can't do that. Let's pray. Would you pray with me? This morning, there's some of you in this house today that you may not have a real relationship with Jesus. I mean, you know all about Him. But you don't know Him. And the step that He's calling you to make is, is to come to know Him as Savior and Lord. And that means that you're looking to Him and what He did on the cross to pay for your punishment of sin. That means that you're looking to Him to be God over your life, not you. You're not going to lead your life. You want Him to be Lord of your life. If that's you, you like to do that. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that means you surrender all of your control over to Him. Because He's rightfully God. You're not rightfully God. And you believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead. You're saved. If you'd like to do that, I, I'd love to talk to you about that. I'd love to lead you in a time of prayer. And so as we sing in just a moment, I'd love for you to come and grab me, just talk to me, and we'll talk about how you can do that. There are others of you in this house, and, and you know what? Your circumstances, you've made them more powerful than the person of Jesus. You're afraid. You're fearful. You're worried. You're anxious. You're like that first story where, where you're like shaking Jesus away. Don't you see? God, why are you not concerned about this? In the middle of that moment, sometimes God just wakes up and speaks grace over your life by calming the storm. And then there's other times in your life where God speaks grace by calming your heart. And just say, my child, my grace is sufficient for you. 
I'm not calming the storm. But I'm going to give you peace in the midst of the storm. So you can walk victoriously over all the waves. So that you can lay your head down and sleep on the cushion beside me. And know that you can trust your Heavenly Father. That even though the storm is still raging, I can give you peace. There's some of you, you just need to come and pray this morning for a miracle in your marriage or a miracle in your relationships, a miracle with your prodigal, a miracle in your finances. And just say, God, I trust you. Please speak peace to the storm or peace to my heart. Don't Listen, don't forfeit your opportunity for peace. Peace doesn't depend on your circumstances. Peace is depending on Jesus giving it to you. And so right now, would you just come and just say, God, give me peace by calming the storm or give me peace by calming my heart. I trust you, Jesus. There's others of you that, man, you were walking in victory, but something just tripped you up. You took your eyes off Jesus for just a minute. And you started to drown. And you're wondering, why do I feel so hopeless all the time? Why do I feel like things are not going to get better? Why do I feel like that? Well, the reason is because you took your eyes off Jesus. And you're looking at the size of your problems instead of the size of your Savior. So this morning, you need to come and lock eyes with Him. Hebrews says that we should fix our eyes on Him. Paul says... That's walking by the Spirit. When you walk according to the Spirit, when you've locked eyes with Jesus, it's walking according to the Spirit and love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that'll normally just pop out of your life because you're walking with Him. Jesus in John 15 says, that's abiding with me. Like when you abide in me, you'll produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can't do anything. You can do nothing. And so there's some of you, and you're just, why do I feel like I'm drowning? I used to walk on the water. Why am I drowning? It's because you've taken your eyes off Jesus. And you focused on your circumstances. This morning, just come and say, God, I'm locking eyes with you. I believe in the power of the person of Jesus over every other circumstance. I trust you. Lord, roll in right over this time in Jesus' name.